Well, good morning. Welcome to April 15th. You know what that means? It's tax day. Well, I I mean, I know it's Sunday, so tax day is actually the 17th. Uh, So if you haven't gotten it done yet, you need to get with it. All right? Get with it. And I know know if you haven't done your taxes yet, it's because you dread the fact probably that you're going to have to pay taxes, right? And give to Caesar uh, more than what you want Caesar to have. Um, but you know what they say, there's, there's only two things in life that are certain, death and taxes. And I, I've just talked to you about one, now I'm going to talk to you about the other. Because that's the question that we're answering today. Uh, the question is actually, what happens after we die? So we're doing this series on complex questions and conversations and you guys did great. You turned in a bunch of questions, way more than we can answer. Uh, and so we're going to look for ways to get back to you and to use maybe in future teaching series some of the great questions that we have and took some of the ones that we thought were the most pressing or the most asked, and we're going to address them. And today, that's the question. What happens after you die? And that's a great question. And it's a very relevant question, Right? Because we all know someone, or we will all eventually know someone who has died. In my line of work, I've spent a fair amount of time with people at the point of their death, or with family, with loved ones, at that moment or soon after someone that they love has died. I'm looking around the room, and and some of us have had that time together. My own life, I faced this question many years ago. My son died early in our marriage. Anne's mom died. More recently, my own father died, as well as friends and loved ones along the way. It's something that we face, and it can bring up questions like, what happens after you die? And unlike paying your taxes, though, did you know you don't have to dread what happens after you die. You you don't have to have anxiety about how it will turn out for you. You can know. We can't know everything, but the Bible, the Scriptures, actually tell us a surprising amount about what happens, about what awaits us after we die, after death. Okay, and that's what we're going to talk about today. So the short answer for what happens after you die, here's the short answer. Heaven. Heaven. Now, the slightly longer answer is heaven for those who, through Jesus Christ, have faith in God. And hell for those who have rejected God. Okay, but you didn't ask a question about hell, so I'm not really going to talk about that part today, all right? We're going to talk about heaven, because if the Christian faith points to heaven as what happens or awaits after you die, then it's important for us to answer what, what really is a second question. We got a second question that was, what do we know about heaven? Well, what do we know about this heaven that the Scriptures point to? as the place that awaits Christians when they die. And to get there, to talk about it, we're going to have to wade through a bunch of misconceptions, and we're going to have to reckon with just the the myriad views that are out there in our culture about heaven and about life after death, right? If you think about it, it's amazing how many of our movies, uh, how many of our TV series, how, how many stories that are told, books that are written, deal with the subject of life after death, or even heaven. And as I was just kind of thinking through a survey of the movies and pictures in our culture that I'm aware of, kind of a a common theme emerges, and it's kind of that picture of after death there being sort of a ghost, sort of a spirit, uh, maybe stuck between two realms or two existences, trying to, to do something to get from one place to another. That's a pretty common view of life after death. In recent years, the undead have made a pretty good comeback, right? (laughs) Zombies are a big topic right now. Lots of shows, lots of discussion about zombies. They're, They're not alive, but they're not dead. What are they? 
In more <clears throat> classical sort of pictures and, and stories about heaven, we sort of get this angel with wings idea, right? Remember Clarence in It's a Wonderful Life? That's a pretty typical viewpoint that, you know, that we become something like that. As a kid growing up, heaven was always presented sort of as a cartoony kind of picture, uh, sort of a, an ethereal place, clouds and people flying around or floating around in heaven. And, and to be honest, that didn't really appeal to me all that much when I was a kid. Uh, the culture that we live in has some very decided big picture views about life after death, one of which is that nothing happens after you die. That's the dead is dead view, right? Uh, I know a lot of people who believe in or hold to some kind of reincarnation, that life is a cycle, that it's a process, and that when you die in this life, you come back or you return, and there's a process you're going through. Uh, many other people talk about when we die that there's some way in which we become part of something bigger. We get absorbed or we become part of the cosmos. You hear that expressed even, even among Christian people when they say, well, that person has died, they've gone, but they're still with us. They're with us in the sunset, right? Or they're with us when we look to the clouds. Um, that's that sense that something happens when a person dies that makes them part of something bigger, and even our Christian and religious views sometimes are a little bit lacking uh, on the actual picture of what heaven is. Uh, again, this picture, I don't even know where it came from, but the idea of, you know, that we're going to be playing harps and sitting on clouds, that sort of thing, that's very common. When I was a junior high age student trying to endure an entire worship service, uh, I struggled with the idea when they said, you know, heaven's going to be endless worship. And I thought, an endless church service? Even now, that doesn't sound that good. <laughs> I'm thinking like the 17th hour in, I'd be done. <laughs> Another popular expression of heaven is, that, is sort of the heaven is what you want view. You know, that heaven's going to be awesome. And so heaven is going to contain that which you think is awesome. Whatever is awesome for you. And for me, when I was a kid, that was dunking a basketball. It's really looking forward to being able to finally dunk a basketball. Today, if you ask me, gosh, heaven would be awesome. I, I think of heaven uh, when I'm in the mountains. You know, we got to live near the Rocky Mountains for a number of years, and we like to go into the Sierra Nevadas, and when we're there, there's things you see and experience, and you go, wow, and this must be like heaven, right? For, for Anne, if it was what she wanted it to be, it would be a big table with all her family surrounding the table. That, that, that feels like heaven right? So what is heaven? What's it actually like? What does the scripture have to say about what happens when we die? Let's start here at a place that's, it sounds kind of basic, but it's really important for us to establish, and it's this. Heaven, heaven is where God dwells, right? The, the most foundational, fundamental thing we have to understand about heaven is that God is there. That's why the scriptures tell us over and over again things like this. This is Psalm 115, verse 3. Our God is in heaven. He does whatever pleases him. God is in heaven. The, the Bible says this literally hundreds of times. The Old Testament book of Lamentations says it this way, chapter 3. Let us lift up our hearts and our hands to God in heaven. Heaven is the dwelling place of God. It's where we find God. In addition, heaven is where Jesus Christ is right now. When Jesus was crucified and buried, he rose from the dead, and after that, he ascended, the Bible teaches us, he returned back to heaven, which is where he is now. Peter wrote it this way, this is 1 Peter chapter 3, Christ has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand. This is an important truth about heaven because it's one of the things that makes heaven really awesome. God is there. Our Lord is there in heaven right now. Now, where exactly is heaven? Well, that's part of the mystery. Right now, that's one of the things that we don't know. Heaven now is just beyond our gaze. We don't see it. 
We, we don't know if it exists in another dimension. We don't know if we know how to describe it in a way that it's something we don't normally see. Sometimes in the Scripture, we get episodes where people were given a glimpse, where the curtain, as it were, was pulled back and people were, were able to see into heaven. But normally, we don't know. It's part of the mystery right now. But what we do know is that heaven is the place where God is now, where Jesus is now, and when we die, believers in Jesus Christ, we go to heaven and we are with the Lord. We go there and we are with Him. In uh, the Gospel of Luke, when it talks about Jesus' crucifixion, there's a really interesting account in there, one of the ones that helps us just get a grasp of what we're talking about. And you, you remember that there were two other thieves on the cross crucified at the same time as Jesus. And one of them is mocking Jesus and saying, hey, if you're so great, why don't you get us all out of this? And the other thief is like, I don't think you should talk to him like that. And they go back and forth for a little while. And it culminates, it culminates in Jesus saying this to one of the thieves. He, he said to him, truly, I tell you today, you, you will be with me in paradise. And that's one of the essential things about heaven. When you have faith in Jesus Christ, when you die, you go and are there where he is. And this is a word, the word paradise, used often as a cinnamon, synonym, a, a word that's like heaven. <laughs> and paradise, do you know what paradise means? Paradise means paradise. Like it's awesome. It's wonderful. And it's joyous. And the main reason for that is because our Lord is there. And when we go to heaven, we are with the Lord. And we are present with Him and close to Him in a way that we are not now. One of the truths of the Christian life is that God is indeed with us. And we do experience our relationship with God and sense His nearness to us. But it is not like it will be. And in fact, as you spend your life living and growing as a Christian, you know there are times in your life where you have that sense of, God, where are you? I'm not sure where you are. I, I, I don't know and sense your presence the way I would like to right now. And that's a part of the reality of our current existence. But when we die and we are in heaven, that distance will be evaporated and we will be joyously, happily with the Lord. And that makes it really good. It's so good. Heaven is such a good place that Paul actually talks about this idea of, you know, I'd kind of rather be there. I would kind of rather be there. This is the way he talked about it in the book of 2 Corinthians. He says, therefore, we are confident and we know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. You hear that? that that's an important conception in Paul's mind of how it works. This current life, this life that's marked by this physical body that I have, this home is different from the life that I have coming with the Lord. So he'll say it this way, when you're at home, when you're in this body, you are away from the Lord, right? And then he says it's so good, it would so good be so good to have it the other way around that he says it this way in verse 8. We are confident, I say, and we would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. And I have to say that this is completely the opposite of the way most of us, even Christians, think. Right? We, we are so firmly fixed in our life and our experience now that we hold on to it so very, very tightly. When here's the Apostle Paul saying, if you knew how good and awesome and joyous and wondrous it is to be with your Lord, you'd wrestle with it the way I do, which is to say, it would be better to be away from the body and home with the Lord. Because that's the second amazing thing about heaven. Not only are you with the Lord, but, but you, <laughs> you get to shed this mortal body. Right? You're free from the weaknesses 
and, and the problems that come with this aging body. You don't have to live very long before you get the realization that this body that you have is deteriorating, right? Things happen, like some things stop working so well, and so you compensate in other ways. You know what I mean? And so Paul says, I want you to know and imagine your future. And you are with the Lord. You're at home with Him. And you are free from the weaknesses, the hindrances of this body. That's a pretty good thing. Heaven is a place of rest in the presence of God. And you think about having eternal or immortal life in these bodies, that wouldn't be so much fun, I don't think. Right? And the thing is that this idea, this promise of heaven, the purpose of it is, him telling us about it, is to give us a very real kind of hope. In another one of his letters, 1 Thessalonians, Paul talks about this quite a bit in chapter 4. And one of those verses, verse 13, says this, Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death. The New Testament often uses the metaphor or the euphemism of sleep to talk about death. We don't want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. We want you to be informed about what awaits you and what is coming so that you can have this hope. Not so that you don't grieve, but so that you can grieve differently than those without hope. The reality is that even with the great Christian hope and promise of heaven, death is tragic and it's intrusive and it's painful and it's against the way God wants it to be for you. It's a result of the curse and the effect of sin that we brought into our experience, into this world, when we rejected God. And so we grieve, and we miss, and we struggle with being separated from those who die. But Paul says there's a further sense of hope that you can have knowing the future in heaven of your loved ones, those who trusted Christ, that others uh, without that hope, cannot have. So, when Christians die, they go immediately to heaven, which is a place of rest in the presence of God. And today, if you're discouraged, uh, may maybe you're facing some of the weakness, some of the mortality of this life and of your body. Uh, maybe you are grieving. Maybe you're on the doorstep of grief, and you know it, it's coming. Let me encourage you to look to heaven as your hope, heaven as your comfort. But this is not the end of the story. There's more to the story, and it starts with a fact that may surprise you. Like I said, the New Testament often refers to uh, death as sleep, but when it does so, it's not referring to your consciousness. It's not somehow implying that you are unconscious or unaware uh, when you are dead or asleep. Uh, the, we don't have time to look at all the places in the Scripture, but they show us this picture of people being conscious and aware. For instance, the book of Hebrews talks about the great cloud of witnesses that surround us. The book of Revelation talks about the martyrs who are in heaven and shows us of a conversation they actually have with God. So instead, when it talks about sleep, it's really referring to it from the, from the perspective of our bodies, which do expire. But by using the euphemism of sleep, it's actually talking about the temporary aspect of us having these physical deaths or being without these physical mortal bodies. Because, this is the part that might surprise you, heaven, as it is now, is temporary. Did you know that? Let me say it another way. Heaven, as it exists now, will not always be the way that it is. Heaven, as it currently exists, is not our ultimate destination. Did you know that? The Bible talks to an, an ultimate heavenly destination called the new heavens and the new earth. That's what uh, Peter is writing about in that passage, the chapter we looked at before. Uh, Peter says this, 
uh, this is ver- chapter 3, verse 13, in keeping with his promise, we're looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. That there will come a point in time where God, in making all things new, does in fact create a new heaven and a new earth. Heaven and earth as we know it are changed and are transformed. Did you know that? As good as heaven is, and it is good, believe me, life in the presence of God, right, free from the burdens and the weaknesses of this mortal life, there's actually something much better that is coming. It's called the new heaven and the new earth, which is our ultimate eternal destination, and it's awesome. You see, heaven, the way it is right now, it's kind of like Lone Pine. Yeah, you ever been to Lone Pine? Yeah, Lone Pine is this little town, and it's right on Highway 395. And Highway 395 is the road that goes up the east side of California, right, and takes you up into the Sierra Nevadas. And every year in July, my family arrives there at the beginning of our family vacation. In fact, there's several families, uh, and we go, we travel together, and when we get to Lone Pine, it's pretty awesome, right? That's because you know how it is when you go on vacation, right? The, The couple weeks before are a lot of work, getting your work life all straightened out so you can be gone. Plus, camping, we're camping, it's a lot of work. My wife always reminds me. And and then we get up early, uh, super early, because some of our people just can't wait to get on the road, and we drive through the morning traffic, and you have to go through the desert, and you do all this, and you finally, right about lunchtime, we arrive in Lone Pine, and it's awesome. People start getting out of their cars, and they greet each other because they're finally awake, and uh, the mountains are there, and you get that first whiff of mountain air, right? And it's awesome. And there's this little park there, and it's got a little stream through it, and people get their dogs out, and the dogs get to go run, and they get to play, and everybody's happy. What one year, a couple years ago when we were there, my brother and his family, they were passing through Lone Pine. It was like a family reunion right there. It's really, really good, and it's way better than where we've been. It's better than the desert, and it's better than the traffic, and it's better than commuting, and it's better than work, but it is not as good as where we're going, because we're headed to Mammoth. We're headed to Mammoth Mountain, right, which is one of God's great places on this earth. And so even though we've made it to Lone Pine, and it seems good, it is good, it's not as good as it's going to be. And that's kind of what heaven is like now. It's good. But the ultimate eternal destination for us is even better. It's the new heaven and the new earth. That's what John's talking about in the book of Revelation when he says this. Uh, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. In that passage, it goes on and on to describe the splendor and the beauty of this new heaven and this new earth. This is the passage where it talks about how God will wipe away all of your tears and there will be no disease and there will be no sickness. And everything will be as God wants it to be. It's awesome. And it's described in very physical, very tangible ways. And so our views and our concepts of heaven that are sort of cloudy or ethereal or um, harpy, I like to say, They don't reflect the way the scriptures talk about your ultimate destination. It's talked about as a place, did you know, where there's homes, where there's dwelling places. That's why Jesus said this in the Gospel of John. He said, don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? These are the kinds of ways that the ultimate heaven is talked about. The Bible describes feasts happening in the new heaven and the new earth. Did you know that? The Bible even talks about there being work, vocation. 
The, the Bible talks about there being relationships between you and people. You're not just going to be up there having a good time by yourself. Because the new heaven and the new earth is exactly what God intends and wants for creation and for humanity. And it's all going to be in its fullness at that moment. Did you know that? So your vocation, that thing that God has designed and equipped and helped you to do, you're going to get to express that in its fullest form without the weaknesses, without the shortcomings, without the burdens now. Your relationships... They're going to be without the weakness, the ego, the pride that you have now. Without the memories that will be, that are unhealed now, they'll be healed then. Everything will be the way God intends it to be. The new heaven and the new earth. And everything that was lost, when we let sin enter the world, when the curse of sin came upon the creation and humanity, all of that will be restored, renewed, and redeemed just as God intends. That's your ultimate destination. Now, in order for this to happen, if you're thinking about this, you might realize that you're going to need something when you get there, and that's a new body. Because of the very physical, tangible nature of the new heaven and new earth, You're going to need a new body, a body that is designed, a body that is fitted for eternity. I don't know if you've noticed this, but the body you have now is not going to last forever, okay? And a very basic but often forgotten Christian truth is that ultimately we will be resurrected. We will receive new resurrected bodies for the final heaven. This is why Paul talked about it in his great chapter on resurrection, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He says, listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, And we will be changed. Paul's talking about the ultimate last final day when Christ returns to the earth. And he's talking about it in terms of, you know, some of you will be alive perhaps when that happens and some of you won't. And it doesn't matter because whether you're alive or dead, you will be changed. And he goes on and talks in that chapter a great deal about the literal resurrected body that you will experience. How the one you have now is not fitted for eternity, it's perishable, and you're going to need one that's imperishable. But that doesn't happen the moment you die now and go to heaven. That happens when Christ returns at the end of this age. Back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. That's what Paul means when he said this. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And so again, we don't have time to look at all of the scriptures about this, but the bottom line is this. That this is why the death of your physical body is described as sleep and as temporary. Because when Jesus returns... And he brings with him those who have died in Christ. You are going to have a resurrected body. That your body will be transformed and changed. You'll be reunited with it so that you can live forever in the new heavens and the new earth with all of its homes and feasts and vocation and relationship. And so Paul said this. This is verse 14, 1 Thessalonians. We believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. And their bodies will be raised. You see, the the heart of the Christian view of what happens after you die and the Christian teaching about heaven and the new heaven and the new earth, it all revolves around this very important uh, teaching, and that is the resurrection of Jesus Christ that you cannot hope for and expect a resurrection of your body if God has not, in fact, 
resurrected Jesus from the dead. Said in the other way, more positively, because God has shown us his resurrection power, because Jesus has been risen from the dead, we know and have hope and confidence that we too will be resurrected. It is the heart and the truth of the Christian faith. Because he rose, we will too. Because he is alive, we will be too. And so our ultimate destination is this new heavens, new earth, where we will live forever in resurrected bodies. And it all depends on the idea of resurrection. And Paul ends his discussion in 1 Thessalonians 4 with these words, verse 18, Therefore, therefore, encourage one another with these words. In other words, do not dread or have trepidation or anxiety about your future and your ultimate destiny in Christ. Be encouraged that although now at this point death exists as a violent and painful separation, a tragic separation between people, it will not stay that way. And you have an eternal future. First, with God in heaven as it exists now and ultimately in the new heaven and the new earth. And so be encouraged. If you are grappling with your own mortality, be encouraged. What you experience and face now in the body is not all that there is, but through faith in Christ you have hope in the future. And the other thing the teaching about the new heaven and the new earth does for me is it makes heaven real. You know, like I said, when, when I was younger, the idea of a cartoon heaven or a cloud heaven or a harp playing heaven, that didn't motivate me very much. But the Bible's teaching about a new heaven and a new earth where we will live and love and work and, and recreate even in perfect harmony with the way God wants it. That's motivating now. It's why, if you have time today to read 1 Corinthians 15 about resurrection, you'll notice that Paul ends that chapter by saying, so therefore, don't grow weary in the work of the Lord. And what he means by that partially is because of the new heaven and the new earth, because it's a very real place, because it has homes and relationships and people, what you do now matters. What you do matters. It's a mystery of how this world is going to be transformed into that. But what we do know is God is at work in that process. And so in two weeks when we all meet together and we go out into the city of Placentia to love Placentia, this is part of the reason that we do it. We do it because as Christians we know what's coming. We've had a foretaste of the divine goodness of love in God and we want others to know it and experience it. We want children to know what it's like to have the resources they need. We want communities to know what it's like to have love and beauty. We, we want people to know that there is a God in heaven who hears their voice and has done something for them. It gives meaning and purpose to the work that we do now. Even the thought that your vocation or your gifts or the way God has created you to be will come to full fruition in heaven, it motivates us now. Personally, I'm very excited because I know in the new heavens and the new earth, I will be a great singer, right? <laughs> I will. Uh, heaven is going to be filled with the sound of my voice. It's in me now. It just ain't come out right. But on that day, on that day, it'll be as it should. And so let that move you now. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. God in heaven, it's so good to think that. You are in heaven. And when we leave this body, this life, you receive us. And we are so grateful that through Jesus we have this life. We are so grateful for his resurrection that proves to us your saving power and gives to us real hope of resurrection. God, lift our hearts today. We have so many very real reasons to be discouraged, to have fear about our futures and the, that of our loved ones. But today we want to hear your word, that you have done the impossible, 
You have redeemed us and our lives. And we have something to look forward to. God, may that fuel not only our passion and our encouragement with one another, but may it drive us to share with others what is coming. And we pray this today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.